Wednesday. I'm Ronnie Dell alongside Tyler Keith here in the studios of 89.3 Lakes FM and Civic Center TV in West Bloomfield. It is Wednesday, Wednesday, Wednesday. Two more days to the oh, weekend, yes. Tyler. Oh, yes. Two more days. Just, you know, keep paddling. Keep paddling through it. We're going one day at a time here. We've been lucky, though. I think yeah. that the week seems to be going a little bit slow. The weather has been absolutely fabulous. And I will say it is football weather. It definitely is. Definitely football is. Football weather. And we have to say, just before we came on the air, well, it was kind of leaked out yesterday, but sources are now confirming published reports Big Ten football is back. What do you think about that? After more than a month of political wrangling, coach chirping, you know, parent protests, player lawsuits, and fan frustration and public outcry, the conference will announce Wednesday it plans to hold a season this fall after all. That's according to published reports. All 14 teams will play and are expected to start games the weekend of October 24th. Two Big Ten sources are confirming. Now, the reported plan is for an eight-game season with the Big Ten championship game scheduled for December 19th. There it is. You knew when, the, uh, when they brought back high school sports, Big Ten had to come back. Yeah, the pressure was really on all, almost all states that, uh, that have Big Ten football teams in them have now allowed high school sports to return. You have historic schools such as the University of Michigan, Michigan State, that are, that are both big names in the conference that can now play ball. And uh, there, there's been a lot of controversy around it, uh, around it because all the other conferences in college football are playing football and have, and have already started their season and seem to be doing pretty well. There's been limited outbreaks in NCAA football so far, so the pressure was really on the Big Ten, and, uh, and now they are just making the decision to resume their season. Were you surprised, though? Not really. I'm, su I'm surprised more that all 14 teams in the conference are going to resume the season. That was more surprising to me than the fact that there was a decision to resume the season. I was expecting at least three or four teams, definitely both of the schools from in our state, in MSU and Michigan, to bow out of the season. I was expecting maybe a team like Wisconsin or Ohio State could also do that. Uh, due to the precautions being taken at the uh, very top of their leadership. But uh, that, other than that being the case, I'm not surprised that B the Big Ten did in some way resume their season. Well, at the end of the day, too, we have to remember this is such a huge money-making mm -hmm. machine for these colleges, the universities, and as well as the cities. Now, keep in mind, obviously, you're still not going to have fans but it still is going to get the ball players back on the grid iron. And I would imagine, you know, when they're televised as well, then you wonder, because we are seeing so many outbreaks on college campuses amongst students, is that going to continue? Because now I would think that they're going to be joined together to watch the game. Yeah, that, that's one precaution that's going to have to, that's one issue that's going to have to be taken into uh, into greater discussion at each of these universities, particularly uh, as of recent times, Michigan State. How are you going to prevent people from congregating, particularly students, but also people coming into these college towns and going to the, to the bars or trying to tailgate in the city at, at houses or other private property that they're not necessarily being heavily regulated, like on-campus tailgating during a regular football season? There's a lot of questions still to be answered for these local cities and for these universities in order to prevent the spread of COVID-19 during the football season from the fans. So right now, Ohio State, Michigan, I'm putting, a, putting you on the spot. Who wins? Oh, uh, Ohio State. There's no, <laughs> there's no question. Ohio State has a far more talented team than the University of Michigan. They're much better coached than the University of Michigan. And I... I don't see Jim Harbaugh as a coach that leads teams to win big games. It just simply doesn't happen. Look at his record against top 25 teams, against Big Ten teams. His record against Ohio State, they have Michigan's number. I don't see Michigan 
winning against Ohio State, being competitive, I think that I think that they are at a point now where they can po potentially be quite competitive against Ohio State and maybe not get blown out as they have year after year over the last several. Go Bucks, because you know I'm from Ohio. <laughs> but I will say, uh, again, uh, the uh, details of all of this expected to come out later and we'll keep an eye on it. So if we do get some more information this morning while we're on the air, we'll share it with you. But uh, there is a lot of other news still going on here in the state of Michigan. So you can always uh, check those out on civiccentertv.com. We update the headlines before we come on air here in the morning. The Senate approves the bill allowing pre-processing of absentee ballots. Michigan Senate approved legislation that would allow local clerks more time to process absentee ballots ahead of the election day amid a surge in absentee voting prompted by the COVID-19 pandemic. The bills would allow clerks to begin opening envelopes from 10 a.m. to 8 p.m. the day before Election Day. Now, while it does allow for them to open the absentee envelope, workers must not pull the absentee voter ballots from the secrecy envelopes. The bill next advances to the House. A lot more to this. So many ins and outs. It, Debbie Binder, the West Bloomfield clerk, has been great about explaining all of the ins and outs of this process and what it works and why this is important. And I would expect that the governor and Secretary of State uh, Benson will address this later today at her 2.30 presser. Yeah, I, I would expect to hear a lot about this from Jocelyn Benson after the, the clear support from the Michigan State Senate today uh, recently allowing for the pre-processing of these absentee ballots. Again, it's not counting these ballots, it's allowing the process of, of, of counting them on election day to get done before election day, which is gonna save hours of time for local clerks and for county clerks who are, who are counting these ballots. We've heard, and, and, you can, and again, I would encourage you, as, as Ronnie did, to look at our interview with Debbie Binder last week. She did explain, in, in, in shorthand, the process of processing absentee ballots and it goes through several steps before the ballot is is officially cast and the votes are counted and clearing up one step of that process could in many ways be the difference between getting results on election day or really really early in the wee hours of the morning on the wednesday after versus having what jocelyn benson previously said here on the megacast election week yeah you know one of the things too that debbie was explaining these poll workers are have to be sequestered yeah so you can't keep them there for three or four days in the time that it could take to actually process so many of these ballots that they are expecting to be a surge this year that is a good point it's hard enough for them as it is to try to get poll workers but now you're saying you have to be sequestered and that could go on for two to three days Who's going to actually want to do that? So we need to come up with some type of solution here. Yeah, and, and protecting the election workers, both at the polls and those on absent voter counting boards, is going to be crucial in this election. Uh, because of the pandemic, there is, in many municipalities, a reduction in the usual numbers of people that have been willing to be election workers. There's been a huge campaign across the state and every municipality to recruit more election workers. And while municipalities such as West Bloomfield Township have, have had a relative amount of success in bringing in new election workers that they're still looking for more because this is going to be a high turnout year with a lot more absentee ballots and you want to ensure the safety of those that are going to be working this election because not having them in full capacity for that entire day is going to could cause the election results to be severely delayed. So again, Governor Whitmer expected to have a 2.30 press conference this afternoon. We'll bring it to you here on civiccentertv.com uh, live so you can uh, follow along to see what they have to say. Our guess is she is going to address this. However, her staff never says exactly what the press conference is going to be about prior to. Also on civiccentertv.com, the Michigan Restaurant and Lodging Association is launching a new campaign in Michigan warning what will happen if changes aren't made to the state's capacity limits. 
New campaign is called Don't Leave Michigan's Hospitality Industry Out in the Cold and is an effort to educate and advocate lawmakers in Lansing for fewer restrictions once the cold weather hits. Industry leaders say they know how to keep everyone safe through protocols that include enhanced cleaning and social distancing. So now the conversation needs to include increasing capacity and getting people back to work. Industry leaders estimate 4,000 plus restaurants will close this year if capacity restrictions aren't eased up. We've talked at great length with some of the industry leaders here on the mega cast and they're saying they are concerned as winter comes what is going to happen because fall time is a nice time to be sitting outside even if they have the heaters but if we're going into december uh, january february and it's five below i'm not sitting outside for dinner yeah certainly there's going to be some negotiating that goes on between Michigan's restaurants and, and Michigan's hotels and their local municipalities where they're based as well as at the state level and maybe even at the federal level to provide additional support. A lot of local cities were very gracious with their, with their city space on sidewalks and on even closing entire streets to allow restaurants and retailers to bring some of their operation outside and be able to, to run a full operation at a social distance without impacting the number of customers that they could have in any given day and those winter months take that away from these businesses so something's got to be there to make up for it or they could be in some serious trouble again like we saw late in the winter and early in the spring last year last uh, earlier this year due to the pandemic also on civiccentertv.com check out the coronavirus headlines uh, the university of michigan filed a complaint in motion in washington county circuit court on monday requiring the graduate employee organization to return to work um is seeking a temporary restraining order and preliminary injunction against the graduate instructors union strike on sunday 80 percent of the union members voted to extend the strike which started on september 8th they want it to last at least another five days Union is demanding better transparency for COVID-19 testing, a universal remote option to work, as well as child care subsidies, amongst other things. If the court grants the injunction, if the employees refuse to work, they could be held in contempt of court. So you'll find those headlines and so much more on civiccentertv.com. We, as I said, we update the headlines each and every morning so that you don't have to do it yourself. We go through all of the headlines throughout the area to bring that information to you. We have a, a good show ahead of us here this morning, Tyler. Yeah, yeah, really good show. A lot of interesting guests, really entertainment based today. We'll go, we'll go through a little bit of music, a little bit of theater, and then also some, some great services as well in the local area. Yeah, so we'll be speaking with the professor of music at Oakland uh, University. Oakland University, also our Facebook partner of the day. We want to say thank you to them for live streaming the Megacast on their Facebook page. So hello to all of their friends following along with us as well. And then we will also be checking in with the director of cultural arts at the JCC and uh, heading over to Birmingham to see how things are going to the museum over there. So we have a lot going on this afternoon here on the Oakland County Megacast. And we are gonna take a quick break. And when we come back, it's all about the music, Tyler. Hi, I'm Dr. Jonay Caldoun. I'm the chief medical executive for the Michigan Department of Health and Human Services. The people who are at highest risk of getting severely ill from COVID-19 are the elderly and those with chronic medical conditions. That includes people with heart disease, diabetes, COPD, or those who have compromised immune systems. People who are in those categories should right now be staying at home as much as possible and not going out if it is not essential. If you fit into one of those categories, those are the things you should do. And if you have a family member who fits into one of those categories, you should be checking in on them and making sure they are following those guidelines. There's something everyone can do to protect the community from COVID-19. This may seem uncomfortable, but so is being hooked to an IV, sleeping in a hospital bed, and fighting for your life. When it comes to COVID-19, comfort is not as important as saving lives. 
Wearing a mask can greatly reduce the chance of spreading the virus. So mask up, Michigan, every time you leave home. Welcome back to the Megacast. Music helps soothe our souls. It helps get us through so many of these rough times that we have been going through. Whether you're into jazz, hip hop, it doesn't matter. Everyone finds music to help them through this pandemic. <clears throat> and it must be an interesting time for Mark Stone. He's a professor of music over at Oakland University. Thanks for being with us this, uh, today on the Oakland County Megacast. I'm happy to be here. Thank you for inviting me. So, uh, Professor, tell us, are you back in the classroom at all? Yes, we started um, in, uh, just a couple weeks now. And um, the music classes, uh, I've been meeting outside with my students. Uh, around Varner Hall under the trees. Um, most of our classes are meeting at about half the normal size and um, anything that can meet online is meeting online. So our, our, uh, a lot of our history classes, for instance, are meeting online. The international studies class uh, I teach is meeting online. But we are playing music in person with masks on, spread out outside, um, and it's going well. Okay, so how do you play music with a mask on? <laughs> I'm a percussionist. <laughs> <laughs> there you go. See, there's just ways around it, right? What's this been like for your students? Are they, are some of them frustrated with the process? Because so much of music is about being around other people and collaboration. Well, my students are delighted to be playing music together again um, after um, a good five months of not being able to play in person with other people. Um, at Oakland University um, and the School of Music, Theater and Dance, we're really fortunate to have some incredible leadership. Our director, Amy Tully, and my chair in the music department, Deb Vanderlyn, have worked tirelessly to ensure our student safety, but also to ensure that they get the quality education that they're there for. So. Uh, it's only been a couple of weeks, but it's going really well. And the students are excited to be back. Uh, they're they're following the safety protocols, and uh, it's it's great for me too. Uh, I was on sabbatical during the uh, the shutdown. I was actually at the University of Wisconsin Madison when everything shut down, and so I hadn't taught in person classes for uh, six months. So it was just a joy to be back and play music. So while the students were not able to be together, how did they fill that gap in trying to create music virtually? Well, we've been uh, stepping up, learning new technologies. Um, uh, a couple programs that I immediately got uh, involved with. Uh, one that has been working really well for teaching uh, private lessons, which I did throughout the summer months. Uh, some guys uh, out west developed called Jam Kazam that has very low latency, uh, much lower latency than Zoom, and it's uh, high sound quality. So I've been doing private lessons with my students over the summer, just one on one, and that's that's gone well. Uh, for group projects, uh, we've been doing some asynchronous, collaborative things. So everybody records their own part, and then we mix them all together. Uh, my colleague Scott Gwinnell in the jazz program and uh, Patrick Fitzgibbon and, and the world music program uh, both did some really great videos they made with all the students recording their own parts. So um, we've been doing both synchronous things and asynchronous things to keep the students uh, active. Mark Stone joining us. He's a professor of music at Oakland University with us today on the Oakland County Megacast. And, and, and Mark, just in, from both your, the perspective of your students and the general public. How has music been able to help people weather this pandemic? Oh, <laughs> music, as I think you said, leading into this, music is food for the soul. Um, maybe our public often sees us as entertainers, but that's actually a, a secondary role. Musicians are healers. Uh, my wife actually works uh, on the front line. She's in an emergency room. Uh, and in Beaumont, Gross Point, and um, she's there on the front line as people have come into the hospital with COVID and, and other illnesses. But um, you know, the concert I have coming up on Sunday, 
uh, we're only allowed to have 100 people present. And before I could even like advertise it to family and friends, we already had that number. So I think people are really excited to uh, to have live music and um, and the 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 healing powers that that all music uh, has. So um, and also, of course, musicians were also educators in, in my job at Oakland University, uh, teaching the next generation of music uh, musicians reflects that. So can you fill us in a little bit about the concert on Sunday? How'd you come up with it? What is the genre? And I know you said it's already filled. So can people, is it going to be recorded so people can watch yeah, it Yeah, and later? actually there's a live, uh, a live stream from the Oakland University uh, School of Music Theater and Dance website. So you just go to the Oakland University School of Music Theater and Dance website. There's a button right there, very easy to access the live stream. So yes, please join the live stream. Um, and so uh, the, I can't take credit for the, the idea for this concert. Uh, uh, International Day of Peace uh, began in 1981 uh, through a United Nations uh, resolution. Uh, and so it's something celebrated every September 21st around the world. Um, I'm actually celebrating a day early so that I can be outside on a Sunday afternoon and with a nice sunshine. Uh, so we're going to celebrate September 20th. Uh, so it's a day of, day of peace around the world. Um, and it's, it's a very important day for us uh, to heal um, our planet, to heal our relationships, uh, begin to heal our relationships with one another, with the environment we live in. And um, I've been fortunate as a musician to travel widely and collaborate with a lot of musicians from around the world. And I actually uh, got the idea for doing Peace Day concerts about 10 years ago uh, through some of my friends from Chennai, India, uh, who have been doing these for a long time. And I really enjoyed doing the Peace Day concerts with the Karnataka brothers, Sashikaran and Ganesh. And uh, three years ago, I decided I should start doing them as well at Oakland University. So this is actually the, the third annual uh, Peace Day concert, and we're going to keep doing it every year. Uh, usually it will be September 21st, so uh, and hopefully next year we can have a larger audience attend. We all need peace right now. Our country can definitely Absolutely. use some Absolutely. peace and some healing. So thank you for trying to do your part in making that happen. So you mentioned that you traveled around the country. Name off some of the places you've been and how has that helped you in your music career? Well, um, I've been yeah fortunate throughout my whole career, uh, even beginning in high school, uh, to travel widely. Uh, in high school, I got to travel uh, to several countries in, in Europe. And then as a college student at the University of Michigan, I did a one-year study abroad program uh, at the University of Ghana in West Africa. Uh, and then later on, I, after doing my graduate studies, I had a Rotary Ambassadorial Scholarship uh, to study in Uganda, in East Africa, at Makerere uh, University. Um, as I mentioned, I've also done a lot of collaboration with musicians from the southern part of India, from Chennai, India. I've traveled there uh, for, uh, for uh, twice, uh, staying a month each time. And then uh, the guy who started our world music program and our jazz program at Oakland University is a man named Marvin Doc Holliday. Uh, he retired way down in Ecuador. <laughs> and so I've also visited Doc in Ecuador uh, a couple times. Um, and I've also... Uh, uh, traveled to the Trinidad uh, and taken part in some steel drum uh, festivals there. So I've been very fortunate to, uh, through the music, uh, collaborate with musicians from all over the world and to, as an extension, get to travel and, and work in those places as well. Mark Stone joining us. He is a professor of music at Oakland University today with us on the Oakland County Megacast. Oakland University, our Facebook partner as well on today's edition of the show. And Mark, not only uh, have you been traveling the world uh, to learn about music and to play music, you, you also have invented a new musical instrument. You've described it as a sort of a stone box. Would you be able to give us some details on what that new instrument oh, is? I, I'm sorry, I don't have it set up right now. Uh, it's it's um, it's a box that you can play three sides of it. And so maybe if you come to next year's Peace Day concert, <laughs> September 21st, 2021, you'll hear it. Uh, in my own group, which is called the Stone Sound Collective, uh, wonderful percussionist uh, Chino Lo Amin Ra, he plays it in the group. So if you've heard of the cajon, uh, basically I, I took the idea of the cajon and extended it so all three sides are playable, not just the, the front side. Um, and. Uh, I could send you a clip when we're done. I don't have it set up to play. I, I set up a different instrument, actually. 
you have such a fascinating background. How how did traveling internationally into so many different places change and shape your musical sound? And do you advise students to be able to try to do the same path that you took? Oh, absolutely. I think, and not just musicians, everybody uh, who has the opportunity, the, the idea of having a study abroad semester or year or just even a summer uh, like I got to do when I was in high school to travel to Europe, uh, it's really transformative. It makes us realize that we're all on this one planet together. I mean, this idea of Peace Day, that's what the United Nations Peace Day is about. Uh, through travel, you realize the oneness of humanity. You know, you, you interact with other people who have, you know, from your profession, in my case, other musicians. And although we have different forms of music, we collaborate, we come together, we appreciate the differences, but we also learn from one another and create new music. Um, and so uh, traveling and just uh, getting to know people, uh, not just with, you know, of course, getting to know people within your community is vital, but also uh, outside of your community and then uh, in other countries as well is, is, is a wonderful thing to do. Mark Stone with us on the Oakland County Megacast. He is a professor of music at Oakland University. Mark, how do you think the pandemic is going to impact the world of music long term um it's, it's, in so many ways um i was just actually talking to my friend from chennai india sashikaran uh, about this uh, uh this morning before the call and um there's there's ways that it's it's gonna make us as uh musicians uh, actually realize the truth of our profession that our profession is about healing because as i said earlier um people need that as uh, healing. Uh, there's a lot of challenges that come with the pandemic. Um, of course, there's economic impact on all of our professions. Um, and certainly, um, concert venues have been shut down for some time. And it's, and they, it's going to be a, a struggle to get things going again. But um, musicians uh, are very inventive. And uh, we'll find a way to, to keep things going, as you've seen throughout the pandemic, uh, with people being resourceful, uh, doing uh, outdoor concerts, uh, doing uh, live stream events. Um, and so I think, um, I, th I think in the end, uh, we will grow from this. Um, I'm already growing from it as an educator. I, I, I have to tell you, I never really liked teaching online, but I, I needed to learn how to do it. And I've actually learned a lot of new teaching skills uh, over the last six months uh, by being in an online environment. For us that have no musical talent, we are so envious of so many people such as yourself who do have that talent, but are you worried after the pandemic and the economic impact it's having on the musical industry that it may shy some students away from going into the field? Um, I guess if we just continue to focus on the the purpose of, of music I think students will continue to go into the field actually I was concerned going into the fall semester what our freshman class would look like at Oakland University and we have normal size freshman class uh, people are coming to school I have two graduate students who moved to Michigan from out of state to study with us and at first I wondered if they would make the move you know during the pandemic uh, and in talking to them, they, they were just hungry to come and learn and to, and to study. Um, so short term, uh, uh, we ha things are going well. I, I do worry about the, the, the long term. And I really worry about the way the pandemic has been politicized. Um, I actually, I th we're gonna overcome this, but at first I saw us coming together and um, the, the disunity um, that I'm seeing uh, broadly um, I actually <laughs> decided to get off Facebook completely because I was seeing a lot of it there. And um, I, um, I'm worried about that. And our country needs to come together. Um, actually, you know, the United Nations has a really beautiful uh, statement uh, about the, the pandemic um, and, and related to the Peace Day concert. Uh, uh, it says that as we struggle to defeat COVID-19, your voice is more important than ever. In these difficult times of physical distancing, this International Day of Peace will be dedicated to fostering dialogue and collecting ideas. 
The world will be invited to unite and share thoughts on how to weather this storm, heal our planet, and change it for the better. Even though we may not be able to stand next to each other, we can still dream together. The 2020 theme for the International Day of Peace is Shaping Peace Together. Celebrate this day by spreading compassion, kindness, and hope in the face of the pandemic. Stand together with the UN against attempts to use the virus to promote discrimination or hatred. Join us so that we can shape peace together. And you can read more about this uh, day. It's not just music events, it's all, all kinds of events. There's ways you can participate from home. Uh, there's a website set up called internationaldayofpeace.org. Um, and it's, it's, a, it's an opportunity for us to all come together uh, set, you know, whatever uh, politics, whatever religious background people have, just come together as one humanity. Mark Stone with us, professor of music at Oakland University, joining us today on the Oakland County Megacast. Mark, just a few more minutes with you before we let you go. I'm told by our, by our Zoom producer, Larry, that you've got a, an interesting instrument there that you, you may I be do. able to play for us. Can, can you show us I'd that? I'd love to. Absolutely. So this is an instrument that belonged, I mentioned that I had the opportunity to study abroad at the University of Ghana. And this is the instrument that belonged to my uh, mentor of uh, 26 years, Bernard Woma. Uh, he passed away two years ago. And after uh, he passed away, his family gave me uh, this instrument. Uh, and so this is Bernard Woma's instrument that is called the Jill, and it's from Ghana. And so I would like to uh, play briefly uh, one of Bernard's uh, pieces. Uh, this is actually the, the piece that I will end the Peace Day concert with. So uh, I'll uh, play a little bit. And uh, uh, again, this is the Jill. It's, it's basically the grandmother of the marimba, the xylophone you might see uh, in the United States. And again, it's from Ghana, West Africa. concert to end our day with. Thank you so much for sharing that with us. You are definitely very, very talented. My pleasure. My pleasure. Thank you for inviting me and thank you for all the work that you guys are doing um, with your program during this challenging time. We all appreciate it.
Oh, and you know what? Good luck with the concert. Mark Stone with us. He's a professor of music over at Oakland University. Check out the event. You can uh, watch it. It's going to be streamlined on Oakland University's website, so you can catch that as well. And Mark, thank you so much. And uh, as you said, we may not be able to stand together, but we can still dream together. So we can dream together that uh, tomorrow is going to be much more peace in the world because we definitely need that right now. Thank you. Mark Stone with us on the Oakland County Megacast. We're going to take a quick break here, but we want to say thank you to him for giving us that brief concert, Tyler. What a nice way to uh, end the segment. Yeah, very yeah, very nice way to end the segment. Great music that you can expect to hear from him uh, at, at the Peace, International Peace Day con uh, concert this, this weekend. More information on that at oakland.edu. Hi, my name is Kurt Lawson, and I'm the Public Information Officer for West Bloomfield Township. We wanted to reach out to you, our older adults, to provide information that you may find useful during this difficult time. We want to ensure you that West Bloomfield Town Hall, our Waters and Utility Department, West Bloomfield Parks, and our Police and Fire Departments continue to work hard on your behalf. Information and resources can be found on the Township website, the Police Facebook and Twitter, or call West Bloomfield Park's COVID-19 help hotline. Please remember to keep your social distance of at least six feet, wear facial coverings when you leave your home, and wash your hands for at least 20 seconds with soap. These precautions will help keep you safe during these difficult times. As rivals, we don't always see eye to eye. Like who scored the best recruits? Who's gonna be who? And whether we wear green, but one thing we can all agree on to help stop the spread of COVID-19. Wear a mask. 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 The ball's in your court, Michigan. Thank you for tuning in to the Oakland County Megacast. I'm Ronnie Dahl alongside Tyler Keith. You can catch us Monday through Friday, 10 a.m. to noon, where we work to bring you long-form, interesting interviews with newsmakers and people of interest throughout the greater Oakland County area and really across the state of Michigan. And next, we want to go ahead and bring in the Senior Director of Cultural Arts for the JCC of Metro Detroit, as well as the Director and Curator for the Detroit Film Theater they are going to be hosting the Detroit Jewish Film Festival coming up. So we're staying with the theme of arts because as fall comes, we will all be trying to get indoors and trying to find new ways to fill our time. So Jamie Loeb joins us right now. She is with the uh, Cultural Arts Center. Good morning. Thank you for being with us on the Oakland County Megacast. Good morning. Thank you so much for having me. So I know we have a little bit of a different setup today where we are going to be interviewing the two of you, but you're in different locations. So go ahead and give us uh, the background of what you have going on. Sure, so I'm the Senior Director of Cultural Arts at the JCC of Metro Detroit, as you mentioned. And one of the things I do is direct the Lenore Marwell Detroit Jewish Film Festival, which is a bit of a mouthful, um, but an amazing event. And this year, we're very excited to be partnering with the Detroit Film Theater to present part of the festival. So we're doing a sort of two stream festival. Um, usually we have a theater, we show movies, we have events in May. <laughs> that is our usual way of doing things. This year, of course, uh, things are a little different. So in October, we're doing an on-demand festival in that all of our films are going to be available on demand from October 4th through October 30th. So people really have a chance to watch every single film if they want to, because we wanted to be sure that our audience really had a chance to enjoy all of our films um, and not really worry about when they're being shown, if they're available, what they have going on that might conflict. So now they have the opportunity to see everything. Um, the other sort of stream of the festival is uh, live film discussions. And that's where the DFT comes in. Elliot Wilhelm is very kindly acting as our sort of film expert in residence. And we're having a lot of 
discussions and Q and A's with uh, directors and producers and actors and all sorts of interesting people that really we actually wouldn't have been able to do quite as much in person because these people are scattered around the world. We show films from around the world. And so it's often really hard to have directors and producers from Europe, from Israel, all of these places come to Detroit, but now it's really easy. So the whole virtual festival model has really opened up a lot of opportunities for us. And we're very excited about that. Yeah, we're all having to switch how we operate uh, during this pandemic. Jamie, it's been cute. Your dog and your cat have made uh, appearances <laughs> in the backdrop. Yep. <laughs> uh, so uh, let's go ahead and uh, bring in Elliot uh, for the interview. Elliot, uh, thank you for being with us. And tell us a little bit how you're going to navigate this on your side with it being virtual. Well, first, I'm going to navigate it as a fan. Um, as a movie fan and someone who loves meeting people and talking to people who are involved in the production of films. Um, I've been showing them uh, and writing about them and talking about them uh, for almost 50 years now. Uh, started at the Detroit Film Theater, began the Detroit Film Theater um, in 1974. Uh, went to work at the DIA just a little before that in the fall of 73 and the series kind of took off um, and it really hasn't slowed down until March of this year. Um, we had the opportunity many times to be able to bring in filmmakers, uh, bring in people who were involved in, in film and have onstage discussions with them and occasionally do things online. Um, but uh, since the pandemic, we've been uh, allowing people to see movies on an individual basis uh, for a fee and the Detroit Institute of Arts gets a portion of, of those funds um, so that we can continue to disseminate great movies and uh, see the extraordinary visions of people from around the world, but seeing them on a virtual basis, uh, seeing them uh, either through a hookup on a flat screen TV or on a, a laptop computer, which is generally how I do it. I'll, I'll mention right now that the world has changed so dramatically. One of the things that I, I do um, in the fall every year is go off to film festivals. This is film festival season. Uh, the JCC Festival is one of the absolutely unmissable festivals, but another one is the Toronto International Film Festival, which uh, I have attended every year for 20 plus years now and am attending at the moment uh, right here at home. Uh, and for the first time, Toronto has uh, pioneered a, a uh, all virtual festival with a drastically cut down number of films. They're just showing 50 films this year instead of their usual 300 over 10 days. Um, and it's impossible, of course, to see everything. One of the things I admire about uh, the Lenore Marwell Festival is that you can see everything if you take the time to do so. Um, it's one of the things that we always wanted to have happen at the Detroit Film Theater as well, so that if you wanted to go to see everything, you could see everything. Um, Toronto has done a beautiful job in terms of uh, getting their streaming set up and getting conversations set up, and it puts me in a very hopeful frame of mind for at least the immediate future, um, because I suspect that we are going to be looking at films and talking about films in this way um, for at least uh, the next um, little while, and that even after theaters are reopened and even after we can attend film festivals, I think that this, this virtual world of uh, attending uh, arts presentations um, is going to be something that people are going to get used to and find appealing in, in some ways. And I think it's going to become a part of how we uh, attend the arts for a long time to come. Uh, having said that, the part of, of the JCC festival that I am most excited about, um, in addition to seeing the films, like every other fan, is to have that ability to converse. So what the DIA's role in this is, uh, is a, an educational function in a sense. We have formed a community partnership with uh, the Jewish Community Center and with the Marwell Film Festival to uh, facilitate these discussions on films, because many of the films in, in this festival in particular, but in, in many of the best festivals, um, have layers of idea uh, and, and layers of thought that go beyond the immediate um, issues of, oh, how did you make this on, on such a small production budget? Or what's it like to meet such and such an actor? 
uh, but to take film seriously um, as the serious art form that it is, um, uh, is, is really important to do with other people and to be able to discuss those things with people who may have questions uh, out there in the virtual world and are, are able to submit those and be part of the conversation, as well as the people who made the films uh, and bridging those international gaps, uh, my being able to converse with someone uh, in another country uh, at, at the same moment is a, a kind of reminder of how powerful and international um, and universal really a language cinema is. Uh, there may be different languages that are translated at the bottom of your screen in many of the films that you'll see, but the, the actual emotional language of film, the thing that connects us all and makes us uh, so addicted in a sense, in a good way, to the cinema since 1895, um, and I remember that year very well, uh, is, is something that is always to be celebrated. And the power of that has never really dissipated. And it's important now that we uh, are able to, to be together in some way. Um, and uh, film and the arts in general bring us together and to talk about how it does and specifically how a particular work of art makes a difference and touches us on a personal level because everybody responds differently to to every film um, is something that I look forward to exploring in this festival uh, in particular. So I'm pumped and ready to go. In, in this particular festival, uh, let's start with Jamie on this. What 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 were some of the focal points that were going that were discussed in planning for a film festival of this kind, with the circumstances at place? Obviously, COVID nineteen safety is paramount in the planning process. But what else was considered in preparing for this year's edition of the fil film festival to be virtual? So we had planned our festival for May before the shutdown. We were, you know, in the final stages of putting the icing on the various cakes. So we had our film lineup um, almost entirely. There have been a few changes due to virtual licensing agreements uh, or not agreeing, agreeing to allow us to show it virtually. And we've added one or two films that, you know, the timing was off before, but now we had time to add them to the lineup. But in terms of deciding how to make it virtual and whether to make it virtual, whether to make it virtual was an easy decision. Um, we did not want to have our audience miss us for an entire year. That would, it's just too much to bear. Like it's, it, we are so sad that we can't be together with everyone in our space, but we have to find a way to be together before next May. That's just too far away. So we wanted to do a virtual festival to connect with our audience for all the reasons that Elliot was just saying. Um, we did some research in terms of the, the various platforms and we tried out some various things and we partnered with Elliot and the D, DFT, DIA to present some screenings over the summer where we relied on um, distributors and producers to provide the sort of streaming platform and it went okay in that you know people could get access, people enjoyed watching the films, but the actual experience was a little clunky. You sort of had to watch on your computer. Um, and being the tech nerd that I am, I said, you know, we can do better. So we found a company called CineSend that a lot of film festivals are using now that basically creates a custom streaming platform for you. So there's a web-based platform, but you can also, um, there's apps for your smart TV, like channels, apps, depending, every TV calls it something different. But basically in your channel store, you just search for Detroit Jewish Film Festival, download that app and poof, you've got like festival Netflix. Um, so it's really easy. And that was, that was paramount. So the safety of doing a virtual festival was sort of a no brainer. Um, the next biggest issue was how do we make this easy for people? How do we make this a good experience? And how do we make it a pleasant experience, even for people who aren't really um, loving, don't really love technology, right? People who use their TVs and don't want to have to care about how it works, right? Those people, we want them to still have a great experience. 
So that's why uh, we put together this custom streaming platform. So people can watch on their computers, absolutely. People can watch on their um, smart TVs. People can watch on their phones, on their tablets. Any how they want to watch, they can, and it will be a simple, easy, seamless experience. So, Jamie, do you, and, you think know, in a way? Oh, I'm sorry. Uh, let me just follow up. Jamie, do you think in a way by making it virtual, maybe more people are going to participate that maybe wouldn't have gone to the uh, festival otherwise? I We have high hopes. Um, so one of the wonderful things about the JCC of Metro Detroit is our facility in West Bloomfield. It is beautiful. And our theater is beautiful and amazing. But the D Metro Detroit area is quite large. And so for some people, I live in the city of Detroit, for example. So driving to work, it's it's effort, right? And so people who live in the city or Ferndale or Huntington Woods, so it's more effort for them to drive to the JCC. So now they have a much easier time, a much easier way to be involved because they don't have that drive. The other thing we're doing is reaching out to outstate communities, communities that are sort of far flung, too small to have their own sort of Jewish infrastructure, their own Jewish film festivals. And we're trying to share our resources with them so that they can participate in the festival as well, because usually they wouldn't, they especially would not make the drive if they're up in the UP or somewhere far away. It's, that's an investment, you know, you'd have to come for the whole week. Actually, we do have a couple of people that do that, but most people cannot make that kind of time investment just to see some films now. All they have to do is, you know, download the app, you know, pay their nickel and they take their ride, as it were. So we're very excited to be able to reach hopefully more people, but in the very least, a wider range of people um, because of that convenience factor. And Elliot, I'm sorry uh, for cutting you off earlier. Can you share your thoughts as well? Yeah, I was I was simply going to say, as, as we were talking about the technology of all of this, that's one of the things that that people love about movies uh, is um, that there is a kind of magic about them. Um, that's been true since the Lumiere brothers first projected movies um, on a wall in the 19th century and, and scared the, the people who were in the room because they thought an actual train was coming at them. And until um, movie theaters closed, I think you could ask a lot of the average patrons, including real movie lovers, um, exactly how a movie projector works and how that technology uh, actually makes people on the screen move around, makes all of these things happen, come to life. A lot of folks don't really know. They haven't thought about the, the whole system of shutters and frames that come down. And now in a digital world, it's also kind of a mystery. And I think it's one of the things that people like about going to the movies. Many of us don't know how a car works. We, we know we get in. We either turn the key or push the button. It starts up and, and we go. Uh, if something goes wrong with it, you want it fixed. If the film breaks, you want it fixed. You don't necessarily know how all of that works. You don't always want to look behind the curtain. And I think it's not so much that there is uh, great difficulty in watching a film virtually, particularly with the JCC Festival. It's going to be very easy for people who, who would normally watch something like Netflix or Hulu on their big screen TV to be able to make that transition to watch these films in the same place, just a, a couple of steps, like buying a ticket and walking into the theater. Uh, but it's that um, sensation of wanting a magical experience and of not having to be in control. Uh, one of the things that I love about going to a film festival is that I don't have to worry about something going wrong in a theater where I'm showing a film. I can sit down and be a patron. And all of the people who will be attending the JCC Festival will have that same experience. Um, if it's a theater, the lights go down, and you don't have anything to do except pay attention to this story that's unfolding on the screen in front of you. And it's all about stories, whatever form they happen to be in. Um, so what Jamie has done really a wonderful job on is, is eliminating many of the barriers of that technology, making it less mysterious and more familiar to people so that they can spend their time with the stories uh, rather than worrying about <clears throat> connecting cables and uh, the other things that, that we don't want to be concerned with when it's, it's time to have a, a magical or trans transporting experience uh, at the movies. 
So, Jamie, for, for people that are interested in attending this virtual film festival, where can they find more information? How can maybe filmmakers or other people that want to get involved still at this point uh, get involved? Well, we don't really have any room for more films. So if filmmakers want to get involved, uh, probably they'd have to send me an email we'll talk about next year or May, which I guess is next year. But yeah, so um, we are full up on films, um, but there's plenty of opportunity to uh, buy a festival pass, to buy individual tickets go on sale October 4th at the beginning of the festival. And I do want to say that we certainly are a Jewish film festival and our mission is to promote Jewish and Israeli films. And that may that may make people assume certain things about what kind of films we show. But when I say Jewish films, that's actually a pretty broad category of things. And Israel makes a pretty broad cat range of films. So I think we really do have something for everyone in terms of, you know, drama, comedy, family movies, uh, documentaries, all those kinds of things. And what's that? What was that rye bread company? Like, you don't have to Jew be Jewish to enjoy whatever brand of right. rye bread. You don't have to be Jewish to enjoy the Jewish Film Festival. So uh, the place for more information is culturalarts.jccdet.org. Or you can just search Detroit Jewish Film Festival. You'll find us. We are on the web. We are on social media. Um, you can find my email address and ways to contact us on the website. So I hope people will check out our lineup and get in touch if they have questions. And Elliot, if I can ask you a quick question, so much of about a movie is the experience being shared with others and the discussion that comes out of watching those movies together. So if I'm not sitting next to someone, how will the virtual discussions work? Well, those will be working um, with with people viewing, um, and and I'm going to fill in to to some degree as much as I can for the, for the audience and ask the questions that I, I like to think uh, they would be asking, uh, and also to be conversational enough to allow a discussion to take me to surprising places with a filmmaker that that I hadn't even uh, dreamed of. But also at the same time for uh, people in the audience to be able to submit uh, questions that they might have for filmmakers and I can make sure that those get through to the filmmaker. Um, uh, just as, as we discuss some things with chat features here um, on the screen today, uh, that's something that people will be able to do. And I hope I'm, I'm correct in that, right, Jamie? Yeah, we'll be, our film discussions will be broadcast live onto both YouTube and our TV apps. Right. And the YouTube channel has a comment feature, well, YouTube has a comment feature that you know, we see in real time. And we also have a phone number where people can text their comments. So it's similar to, to a Zoom event or any other uh, YouTube event where people can just chit chat away in the comment section. And um, we will be encouraging people to, you know, talk to each other in the comments because that's part of the fun. So Jamie- And, and far uh, less complicated than it sounds. And I'll, I'll say one more <laughs> thing about that. One of the, the joys of, of being at a film festival is to have people around you re responding and reacting to a movie. Um, and also one of the annoyances at a film festival is having people all around you talking and responding during the movie. Um, if, it's, if it's inappropriate uh, or somebody is saying this, uh, I, you know, I've seen this before or that's the worst movie I've ever seen. Are you kidding? This is the best movie I've ever seen. That's all fine for afterwards. Um, but there's also something to be said for being able to be alone with the film as you're watching it, uh, and then to have your thoughts sort of flower uh, and to discuss those with others uh, afterwards. So the annoyance factor of popcorn being dropped down the back of your neck is, is not there, um, but all the good stuff is. That's a good thing to point out. I always get so irritated with people talking loudly during a movie. Uh, we are with Jamie Loeb. She's the Senior Director of Cultural Arts at the JCC in Metro Detroit. Elia Wilhelm, Director and Curator with the Detroit Film Theater. Real quickly before we let you go, uh, Jamie, how will the tickets work? Can I buy one for just one day? And what's the price range? So we don't have days. The films are just on demand available whenever you want them. So 
the price for a single film starts at five dollars and we're asking people to pay five dollars per person watching um our usual ticket price you know when you walk in the theater in the before times was thirteen dollars uh so we've had we've cut down our prices to to mirror renting a film on uh amazon or youtube or something like that but we're hoping that people will support the festival by paying per person that is watching. Um, you can also buy a festival pass for $180 per person. Um, and then you get all of the films all the time whenever you want them. When you buy an individual ticket, again, that starts at $5 and you get an email with a code and a link and you go to the code of the link within 24 hours and poof, watch your film. Um, again, it's very much like watching renting a film off of hulu or um what's the other one amazon 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 thank you uh you know any other streaming service it's a similar sort of thing you know you you pay your money they they let you watch the film the only difference is that intermediate step of the email um but it's it's fairly foolproof we're, we're trying real hard to make it as easy as possible um, even for people who are buying tickets to individual films. But of course, the festival pass gets you the sort of premium experience of you just log in once and poof, you have festival Netflix and it's pretty great. So um, again, all of that information is on our website, which is culturalarts.jccdet.org slash film fest. So hopefully people will join us. You're listening to 89.3 WBLD Orchard Lake, 88.1 WBFH in Bloomfield Hills. Jamie Loeb with us, the Senior Director of Cultural Arts at the JJC or the JCC. Elliot Wilhelm, the Director and Curator at the Detroit Film Theater. We hope you have a great film festival. You've done an amazing job of trying to pivot and transition to a virtual world. Check them out. The festival is going to be October 4th through the 30th. And let's hope that by May of next year, you will be able to have an in-person film festival. That's our hope. Yes. <laughs> Thank you for having us. Thank you so much for being with us on the Oakland County Megacast. We're going to take a quick break here. And when we come back, we are going to transition and head over to Birmingham and speak with the director of the museum. They have some interesting events coming up for the fall time that we want to share with you. You are listening to and watching the Oakland County Megacast. Hi, I'm Dr. Faust, the medical director for the Oakland County Health Division. The most important thing you can do to prevent the spread of illness is to wash your hands thoroughly and often. Follow these six easy steps every time you wash your hands. Step one, turn on the sink and wet your hands with warm water. Step two, apply soap to your hands and lather between your fingers, under your nails, and the front and back of your hands and wrists. Step three, wash your hands by scrubbing them together for at least 20 seconds. Step four, rinse your hands with warm, clean water. And step five, dry your hands with a clean cloth towel paper towel or hot air blow dryer. If you're using a cloth towel, make sure to change it often. For handheld faucets, turn off the water using a paper towel instead of your bare hand. Step six, if you're using a paper towel, throw it away. Practice healthy habits like washing your hands after coughing or sneezing into them to keep you and others healthy. Go to oakgov.com health or call Nurse on Call at 1-800-848 5533 to learn more. Michigan, the coronavirus pandemic has put us all to the test. And now it's time to put COVID-19 to the test. As we move forward, testing will be critical. We encourage anyone who has reason to get tested to do so. Those with symptoms and those without. If you are leaving home and going back to work, get tested. If you think you may have COVID-19 or you've been exposed recently through family, friends, or coworkers, get tested. Our test locator tool can help you find the right testing site that fits your needs. Even if you're looking for easy access with no cost, no prescription, and no appointment necessary, we've got you covered. Help Michigan move forward, not backward. To find a testing site or learn more, visit michigan.gov slash coronavirus test. A message from the Michigan Department of Health and Human Services. Thank you for 
for tuning in to the Oakland County Megacast. I'm Ronnie Dahl alongside Tyler Keith. You can catch us Monday through Friday, 10 a.m. to noon on CivicCenterTV.com, Birmingham Area Municipal Access. And if you do have cable, channel or 15 on Comcast and channel 99 on AT&T. And of course, you can always catch us on the radio, 89.3 Lakes FM and 88.1 FM, the Biff. And we also want to say thank you to Oakland University for being our Facebook partner of the day. They are live streaming today's broadcast. We want to say thank you to them. As we head into fall, people are looking for new things to do because the weather will be getting a little bit colder. And so some of the events we've been doing outside may not be as enticing. But fall time to me, Tyler, is also about halloween and all things halloween related oh, and yeah. i have to say i'm excited to bring in our next guest leslie pilak she is the director of the birmingham museum you have one of the coolest backdrops right now via zoom that we have ever seen thank you for being with us on the mega cast you're welcome I, I do have to give credit this is a photo taken by one of the volunteers that does cemetery tours uh, which i'm guessing we'll be talking about and I think it's a stellar photo, so had to share it. Yeah, so for those on the radio that aren't seeing what we're seeing right now is it is a foggy backdrop of the cemetery. And that leads us into what we wanna talk about is the Friends of the Birmingham Museum conduct cemetery tours in the fall time. Tell us about that and what can people expect? Sure. Um on a regular basis uh, for a number of years now, the Friends of the Birmingham Museum, which is really the also the Birmingham Historical Society, AKA, uh, have been conducting uh, tours, docent-led tours throughout the historic Greenwood Cemetery in Birmingham. The Greenwood Cemetery is the oldest public cemetery in Oakland County, for sure, and in a lot of um, lower Michigan. And the story of its founding is part of what um, is featured on each tour because it was actually the result of a horrific axe murder that was committed in 1825 when Birmingham was uh, just a small settlement, which didn't even have the name Birmingham yet. And um, so the history of the cemetery, although it starts with such a terrible crime, um, actually includes some of the most interesting community history um, of really any place in, um, in Oakland County. And I, and I also have to mention there are other historic cemeteries that are very, very interesting also, but they came about slightly later. So uh, we claim that you know earliest um, uh, role. The cemetery is a beautiful setting. It is, um, uh, has rolling uh, landscape. Uh, it's a beautiful park-like setting with mature trees. It's one of the most peaceful areas in the city of Birmingham. Um, if you can imagine such a busy city having a quiet, peaceful place, this is it. Um, the cemetery uh, has over 3,000 graves about 650 of them being from the 19th century. So when the cemetery tours are conducted, the docents uh, lead the participants through the cemetery, through different uh, parts of it, and talk about important people who have been uh, buried here, really from the earliest times all the way up until recently. Leslie Pilak with us. She's the director of the Birmingham Museum. Leslie, I went to school in Charleston, South Carolina, and history is so important down there. I did my first cemetery tour while, a while I was a college student, and it was fascinating, the history behind uh, the city, and that's what it was. It was sharing the history of the city as well, but they actually enacted parts of like the plays and this and that uh, in the cemetery, but tickets were very hard to come by. Do you have to have a ticket for this event and do they sell out or are plenty available? Well, um, great question. And of course, during our pandemic um, environment, we're uh, making some adaptations to make the tour uh, as comfortable for people as possible. Generally speaking, uh, this year we are not expecting to uh, have any 
set limits. Uh, we do have under the governor's order, there would be, you know, if we had 100 people, um, that, that would be the maximum that we can have. This is an outdoor activity and we will be practicing social distancing. Every participant is expected to wear a mask. Um, we'll be following all the necessary public um, health precautions. And, uh, but the plus on this, um, this year is that we have been able to provide the docents will be leading people through with uh, voice amplification devices. So they'll be very easy to be heard, even when people are uh, strung out a little bit more into a wider um, range. It is a large cemetery. There's enough room for um, that many people to walk along um, and practice social distancing. The ticket price of $10 per person would be payable at the gate um, in cash or with a check because we won't be able to make any kind of um, exchange, uh, any kind of cash uh, change or anything this year or use credit cards. So it must be cash or check. Um, there is a sign-in procedure. There is a liability waiver this year that we are asking everyone to sign to participate. And uh, the, uh, if people want to come to the tour, they would um, come to the Greenwood Cemetery, which is on Oak Street in Birmingham. And they would um, come to the East Gate um, and they would enter there. And I need to just add one more comment here about um, the physical access there is no parking inside the cemetery. Um, participants will have to find parking on the street outside the cemetery and then walk to the cemetery. Joining us today from the Birmingham Museum is their director, Leslie Pilak, with us today on the Oakland County Mega Castle. So on these uh, on these tours of the historic cemetery, the historic Greenwood Cemetery, what are some of the attractions or historic or historic attractions rather on location that people can expect to be able to see and, and learn about along their tour? Well, actually, there are so many interesting people buried here in Greenwood Cemetery that uh, the docent-led tours are actually separated into a pioneer tour and a, a 20th century notables tour. So for our um, fall tour, we concentrate on the oldest uh, cemetery inhabitants. I mentioned at the outset that the, um, the cemetery was founded because of a terrible ax murder that took place in 1825. And so that is actually the beginning of the tour talks about um, that incident and the people involved, um, their graves are marked there and all of the particulars about how the cemetery was founded as a result of their deaths because the community wanted to come together and acknowledge their uh, passing um, by having a, a public burying site for them. And that became our public cemetery. Um, so that story is told and um, the people involved, their name, their names were Pollyann and Cynthia Utter. And uh, so the whole history of the Utters and, and what happened to them and um, is, is the beginning of the tour. The tour also includes a number of other um, Birmingham pioneers. Uh, as was mentioned you know, at the beginning of our interview here, there is a lot of history behind individual stories that um, people don't generally learn about until they're actually walking through a cemetery and a docent is explaining to them why this particular person made such an impact on this uh, community. And I think that's the people part that um, we always accentuate. And I think that's the, the advantage of any cemetery tour is yes, you are touring a historic site and, and it is you know about a, a community's history, but it's about the people and most of them um, are, are you know important for their community, but they may not be uh, uh, the kind of names that everybody would know. So in our cemetery tour, we basically tell the story of Birmingham's founding by talking about the different uh, important people who found Birmingham. Another interesting story relates to John West Hunter and his family who came here and were the first land purchasers here in the, the place that is now called Birmingham. And the uh, couple of other um, men who came with him and kind of had a business scheme uh, to make some money and uh, did that by purchasing all their property 
to connect uh, along the Saginaw Trail, which is Woodward Avenue, going through Birmingham. So their story is told. Um, their their wives were sisters and all and migrated here together. So their story is told. Um, further on in the tour, uh, one of our local, um, I kind of think of her as like the queen of Birmingham in a way, uh, Martha Baldwin, who came about um, in the latter part of the 19th century, which really changed our town. And she's responsible for a lot of the um, important uh, civic and community um, organizations that still function here, including the Baldwin Public Library, for example. And so her story and how she connects to women's suffrage will be part of uh, the tour. And if I can just stop to say that the the suffrage um, movement, which uh, ratified the 19th Amendment 100 years ago this year, is, is an important feature that will be included this year. And lastly, um, for me to mention right now is that we recently learned um, about the burial in the cemetery of formerly enslaved uh, people who had lived in Birmingham and um, were the first African-American property owners in Birmingham and who were buried in Greenwood but did not receive a marker. And we did not know of their existence because uh, their story had been lost until it was rediscovered again by a, by a volunteer, um, George Getchman, who uncovered their story and then we've done some additional research so we know exactly now where they're buried in the cemetery we know more about their story how they were escaped slaves who came to birmingham or the birmingham area farmed um, for many years and then purchased a home and became a, an important part of the community right around the turn of the century um, so their story is going to be included and we also are uh, making it possible for people if they would like to donate to a campaign to raise money to install a monument, uh, they'll have that opportunity also. Such fascinating history right there in the city of Birmingham. Do you know how he was able to discover the information about the Taylors so late? Yeah, it's kind of it's kind of amazing. But if you can think about every detective novel you've ever read and how uh, the detectives are putting together just different strings of information and, and t trying to create a fabric of what happened, it kind of came up like that. Um, it was an obituary that had been printed in the local newspaper, which no longer exists in print form, of course, but it was on microfiche. And the researcher, George, was uh, looking through um, some materials and came across this obituary and read it and was fascinated. I mean, the, the names of the people are, were recorded and we have them in the cemetery, but no one knew their story or knew that they were African-American or that they were former slaves until this obituary service. So once he found the obituary, we, we all worked together on that. Um, and we got uh, some good partnership in the community from the um, Daughters of the American Revolution local Heidi Hill chapter, as well as the Friends of the Birmingham Museum that I mentioned, working together to get these funds raised. So um, it is sometimes a little bit of, uh, um, you know, fortune, um, just kind of stepping, knocking on your door and saying, here's something you didn't know existed. And then it opens up a whole doorway. And, um, so. Uh, we're very excited about this uh, project because it's going to recognize these people who clearly were a big part of the community and very well well known and highly regarded and yet we didn't know they existed so we want to bring bring their lives back into focus for people from this point forward now still uncovering and discovering our history so leslie while we have you on the show can you bring us up to date as to the museum, is it still closed to the public or are some aspects open? Thanks, um, yes, we are closed to the public. That is to say the actual physical building is not accessible to the public, but we are um, open in the sense that we're doing a pop-up exhibit for our museum, literally taking materials outside under a tent and as a pop-up on Friday afternoons in September. Um, we're focusing on our suffrage uh, related materials. We have some really interesting women from Birmingham who did some pretty incredible political things. For example, the first woman mayor in Michigan was from Birmingham. 
Um, we also have someone from Birmingham who was a, an, uh, the first woman astronaut in a group of women astronaut trainees um, and uh, a number of other fascinating women who, uh, as soon as women earned the right to vote, they got involved in politics right away, local and, as well as further out. So we're um, talking about that at our, uh, let's call it a pop-up stand for lack of a better term right now. Um, we're also uh, doing a lot of virtual material. People can go to our website, which is www.bhamgov.org forward slash museum. And you can find content links to you know numerous uh, uh, um, virtual um, exhibits. Many of our video materials are there. We have video shorts. Uh, we have behind the scenes in the museum. You can see what it's like to walk into some of the back rooms in the museum. We unbox uh, items and uh, a lot of other interesting content. So uh, we hope that if people have more questions, they'll call us. Um, the number here is 248-530-1682. Such fascinating stuff for uh, all of us to really take time to learn about the history of the cities in which we live. Uh, Leslie, thank you so much for taking time out of your schedule to be with us here on the Oakland County Megacast. We definitely appreciate it. Thank you very much. It's great to be here, and I hope that everyone enjoys all local cemeteries this fall. Absolutely. We have a beautiful one in Pontiac as well, a you know, very historic cemetery in Pontiac as well that I like to go to fall time an incredible time to visit with the leaves turning as well. So Leslie Pilak, director of the Birmingham Museum, the cemetery tours are going to be taking place Saturday, September 26, 1 p.m. Tickets are $10. So, and the proceeds are going to go to help get a marker for George and Eliza Taylor. Always interesting, interesting stuff. Have you ever taken one, Tyler? I have not, no, I might have to this fall. You, you should absolutely do it. Uh, as I said, I started in, in Charleston, uh, did a couple while I was a, a college student down there, and it is interesting, and it's just a reminder of where we came from and the people and the steps before us and what they did in their lives have helped shape our future and our, and our today. So thank you to uh, Leslie for being with us. We're going to take a quick break here on the Megacast, and when we come back, we are going to check in with the Ringwald Theater and Ferndale, see how they are surviving the pandemic. This is the Oakland County Megacast. Michigan, we're calling on you to save lives. Don't ignore it. Don't let it go to voicemail. It's urgent. In fact, it's critical. Because if you've been in close contact with someone who tests positive for COVID-19, you may have been exposed to the virus. And you could get a call from My COVID Help or your local health department. So please answer the call to learn how to protect yourself, your family, and friends. We're calling on you to stop the spread of COVID-19, to make it safe to reopen businesses and help Michigan move forward. So if you get a call from My COVID Help or your local health department, you may have been exposed to someone with COVID-19. To protect us all, answer the call. Learn more at michigan.gov slash contain COVID. A message from the Michigan Department of Health and Human Services. Hi, I'm Dr. Jonay Caldoun. I'm the Chief Medical Executive for the Michigan Department of Health and Human Services. The people who are at highest risk of getting severely ill from COVID-19 are the elderly and those with chronic medical conditions. That includes people with heart disease, diabetes, COPD, or those who have compromised immune systems. People who are in those categories should right now be staying at home as much as possible and not going out if it is not essential. If you fit into one of those categories, those are the things you should do. And if you have a family member who fits into one of those categories, you should be checking in on them and making sure they are following those guidelines. There's something everyone can do to protect the community from COVID-19. Thank you.
you for tuning in to the Wednesday edition of the Oakland County Mega Cast. You can catch us Monday through Friday on CivicCenterTV.com, Birmingham Area Municipal Access, 89.3 Lakes FM and 88.1 FM The Biff. And as high school sports, college sports getting back to the gridiron, student athletes being allowed to play what's not happening, our theaters are still closed. So how are they surviving? We want to go ahead and bring in Joe Bailey. He's the artistic director uh, over at the Ringwald and Brandy Joe Plambeck, the media director. Thank you for being with us on the Megacast. Hey, Joe, can you guys hear us? Oh, let's there unmute you, you. That might help. Hey, hey, Joe, are you guys there? Yeah. Hello. Hey, thank you for being with us on the Megacast. Thanks for having us. Yes, thank you. Uh, you know, the the theater is still closed. How are you surviving? Well, <laughs> it is an unprecedented time. Um, we were lucky to get some grants to help us along. Um, and then since the shutdown, we have put out a couple of virtual things that we filmed uh, that are sort of on brand for us. We did a Golden Girls parody Zoom call um, using four male actors as the Golden Girls. I was Rose. <laughs> and then we just did a Facts of Life one uh, a couple of weeks ago uh, using, again, three male actors and one cis female. Um, and I was Mrs. Garrett. And I was Natalie. <laughs> so that's sort of what we've done so far. We have a, another thing planned for the coming months or so. So hopefully by then we'll be able to get back to business. Yeah. How long do you think the theater can survive if it remains closed? Well, I don't know. Um, I've put off having those thoughts just yet because for the moment we're fine. Um, and you know, it's just a matter of vaccine and, you know, there, there, we have a friend who runs a theater in Florida who has now about to start his third show. Uh, they opened back up in July, I think. So it's just a kind of wait and see kind of situation. And even when we can open, when they say, okay, you can open your doors. It's like, do people want to come back and sit in a tiny little space like ours is? Um, so that's like the other side of it as well. Um, but I mean, we are good for now. We, you know, I think we'll be good at least through the end of the year. Um, and we're just looking at ways to continue to make content, even if we can't have our theater open so that we can still generate income and more importantly, so we can like keep our artistic juices flowing because that's like really what it's all about for us. We're joined by Joe Bailey and Brandy Joe Planback, the artistic and media directors of the Ringwald Theater with us on the Oakland County Mecca cast. So in regular times, and if and when we get back to that, hopefully sooner rather than later for your operation, what can people usually expect? What kind of shows can people usually see at the Ringwald? Um, we're a, a fairly eclectic mix. Um, we're kind of known as the gay theater. We do like a lot of parody stuff, especially in the summertime. Uh, we do like our summer camp thing that we like Mommy Dearest parodies, uh, whatever happened to Baby Jane, Golden Girls sort of things. But we also do, we do musicals. We were the first theater to produce August Osage County locally. So um, so it's kind of a, an eclectic mix. So you had mentioned about the creative side of this and trying to stay connected. Are you trying to do some things virtually to keep that going? Yes, we have done two things so far virtually that we filmed and made available for uh, for the general public um, on a name your own price kind of situation. Um, and when the lockdown first started, we put up one of our parodies that we did a few years ago as a fundraiser uh, for people to donate and get a copy of that. And we're looking at another one coming up maybe around the holidays or so. Um, and then beyond that, we don't have anything cemented. And so far, everything that we've done, we've written ourselves or rather 
for the most part, um, the last two parodies we had, we had um, Vince Kelly and Matt Arrington, and Vince Kelly used to be a part of the Ringwald, who now lives in Minneapolis, have written those for us. Um, although other larger like playwrights like throughout the United States, the streaming rights have become available to certain plays. Um, we haven't actually like really heavily looked into those. We've kind of been writing our own content because it's a little easier to produce and put together. One thing we have learned from so many other organizations is this crisis has also forced all of us to get creative. Do you think there is a positive that will come out of this for you and the Ringwald Theater? I mean, it certainly is, uh, like you said, it's forcing us to think in ways that we have never thought before. And also, it, I think it, it has the possibility of extending our reach just outside of the Detroit area in terms of the content that we produce. Um, so I think once things get back to normal or get back to what will be our new normal, um, I anticipate that we'll probably still keep our fingers in that pot for um, for a while just to, you know, sort of keep that reach going. And one interesting thing we haven't mentioned, in October we're doing our Gay for Detroit Festival. It's normally done in June um, as sort of like a gay pride celebration, but this year sort of gay pride was canceled and it was originally kind of rescheduled for September. We thought things would be better then. Um, and now we've just sort of pushed it to the end of October. It's October 23rd through the 25th. And this year we asked for our play submissions um, from to be submitted from anywhere around the world and to cover sort of the theme of um, how things have been since the pandemic hit to have that sort of a spin on the subject matter. So we picked five really great scripts that will be produced virtually um, in a number of various ways. And some of the directors and the actors are from different places in the United States. Um, but it's sort of a, a cool way to address how this has affected people like within the gay culture um, since the pandemic hit. We'll also have a drag show and a comedy special as well. So it'll be a pretty cool weekend. So how do you produce plays virtually? Can you just kind of give us some insight into that, how it's gonna look? Yeah, it's. I've heard a lot of people in the theater community, there's been a lot of discussion because uh, things need to be filmed. And so that really takes away the nature of what is theater. But it's also not really film because you're filming a play and not using all of the tricks of the film community, if you will. So I think we've all sort of been creating this hybrid of theater and film. So these particular scripts will be filmed um, and we've given the directors sort of free reign of however they see fit to film their particular show that they're doing. So, but yeah, I sort of liken it to like, if you see a show like a Broadway show on PBS that's been filmed, I still feel like I've seen that show, even though I wasn't there live and it wasn't like a film of it. So it is this weird hybrid that I think we're all just trying to get comfortable with. I think the most common go-to for these sort of virtual shows since the pandemic hit is to do sort of a Zoom presentation where you have different people on their different cameras because it's the safest and easiest way to do it. Um, you've seen some creative ways that people have done that. Um, with our two summer shorts, The Facts of Life and The Golden Girls, we did this summer. Um, we filmed it virtually through Zoom and then we edited it together through having done it a couple of different takes. So it is sort of have, it does have that cinema, like that editing that you would do with film, but and we would add like a laugh track because you can't have a sitcom without that. Um, but we're looking at some various ways. We've really instructed the directors for Gay for Detroit to, as Joe mentioned, to sort of, you know, be creative, do whatever they'd like, as long as they're keeping safety measures and measures in place. Um, all the shows have only two actors. So, Ideally, we've mentioned, you know, if you're using two actors, maybe you use two actors who have been quarantined together like Joe and I have, um, and that that is like a good route to go. Um, so yeah, it's been, you see, you've seen like a lot of different things, but for the most part, it's been like a Zoom sort of presentation because it's the easiest and safest thing to do. Joe Bailey and Brandy Joe Planback, both from the Ringwald Theater, joining us today on the Oakland County Mega Castle. For those that may want to get involved in these productions, maybe as actors or, or as uh, stagehands, whatever the case may be, how could they potentially get involved in this, or is there availability for that? Yeah, we're always, our doors are always, well, 
you know, theoretically always open uh, for anyone who wants to get involved. Um, probably the best thing would either be to go to our website, which is theringwald.com, or you can uh, follow us on Facebook, um, all the socials, you know, Instagram, all those things. Um, and we always uh, you know, disperse information that way too. So I know that the theater is actually a non-for-profit and I feel like in the beginning of the pandemic, people were reaching out to help support organizations like yours, but as this continues to drag on, have you noticed the financial support is starting to lag behind? And how do you want to infuse that enthusiasm to keep the theater going because it is such a needed part of the community? Yes, we have noticed that. Um, I think, you know, when this all started, it was so, so unprecedented that I think everyone was just pitching in what they could. Um, and I think as, as you have said, as it's worn on, I think people have become more concerned about their own personal finances and their own personal situations. And since, I mean, really we're in the state of Michigan, we're kind of like almost the last industry who is still not allowed to open our doors yet. Um, so, and like, you know, like Brandy Joe said, once we do, it's gonna be a matter of like, are we gonna have diminished possibility of people in the space? Are people gonna want to come? So we're just trying to think of ways that we can uh, generate excitement with our content and be true to our brand um, and just try to ignite that um, excitement in people to want to see what we're still doing and to keep contributing to us so that we can still keep doing that in the future. So as you mentioned, you are one of the last industries to be allowed to reopen. You are still closed. What are your thoughts on that, especially now that football and sports are being allowed to return? I mean, I support our governor. So I I mean, it's unfortunate that we're not open. Um, but at the same time, like even if she said today you can open, I don't know, you know, I don't know if people are gonna want to necessarily come visit us just yet. Um, so that's just gonna be a measure of trial and error, I think, to see how that all works out. But I mean, I'm content to wait it out um, until it's as safe as it possibly can be. I know, I think they, the latest word in New York is that it, they're saying like, maybe not for another year will their theaters be back open. And there's nothing definite, but that's sort of the latest like word that's on the street, on the internet rather. Um, and I'm hoping, you know, we don't have to wait that long. Um, but New York is obviously a much different story than we are here. Um, but yeah, I think our, our friends in Florida, like the theater where he is on his third show, I think that they have like a maximum of like 15 or 20 people that can fit in there. They're all spaced apart. Um, and I don't know if we could only have like 10, because our space is so tiny, if we could have 10 people in there, it would just be a very interesting experience to, to have a show. You, yeah, could, you could sell it as an intimate, <laughs> you know, a, a private showing and maybe charge more. <laughs> That's right. true, because having only 10 people at a performance, I don't know if it would be financially viable for us anyway in the end. So so it's really just a whole bunch of wait and see, I think, at this point. And it is exciting to see what people are doing um, out in the industry to keep things fresh and interesting. Open Book Theater and Trenton, they have like driveway theater where you can pay so much money and they'll come out to your driveway and do a show. They're also doing like one-on-one -on -one sort of like Zoom presentations. Um, and it's, so it's just, it's fun to see what people are doing to keep the ball rolling, to keep their creative energy up and to engage with their audiences. It's, it is a really interesting time for that and a very cool thing to watch what people do. Mm -hmm. Joe and to be a part of yeah, Joe Bailey and Brandy Joe plan back with us. They are with the Ringwald Theater. If people want to support your organization to help you keep the doors open, how can they do that? The best way would be to go to our website, which is www.theringwald.com. And there is a donation page on the website and you can give that way. 
And we'd be forever grateful. Forever. <laughs> forever grateful. Well, we appreciate you taking time out of your schedule to be with us here on the Oakland County Mega Cast, And we are looking forward to, uh, you know, the festival coming up in October. Maybe we can have you on again before the festival. It's the end of October. But support the Ringwald Theater. Thank you so much. And keep your spirits up. And we hope to see you uh, back open here soon. Well, thanks, thanks, Ronnie. Thanks, thanks for having Tyler. us. We appreciate it. Such a fun group, and it is a great theater. Yeah. Uh, if you've ever never been to a production there, when they do reopen, I suggest uh, that you take the time. It's so funny and so incredibly creative. We're going to take a quick break here on the Mega Cast, and when we come back, we are going to be speaking with the owners of Chefs for Seniors. This is a great, great service that uh, so many people really need right now. And it's great that they're able to do that and offer it here in the Oakland County area. You're listening to and watching the Oakland County Megacast. Michigan, the coronavirus pandemic has put us all to the test. And now it's time to put COVID-19 to the test. As we move forward, testing will be critical. We encourage anyone who has reason to get tested to do so those with symptoms and those without. If you are leaving home and going back to work, get tested. If you think you may have COVID-19 or you've been exposed recently through family, friends, or coworkers, get tested. Our test locator tool can help you find the right testing site that fits your needs. Even if you're looking for easy access with no cost, no prescription, and no appointment necessary, we've got you covered. Help Michigan move forward not backward. To find a testing site or learn more, visit michigan.gov slash coronavirus test. A message from the Michigan Department of Health and Human Services. Michigan, we still need to stay careful because we don't want to go backwards, back to where we started. So keep standing six feet apart keep wearing a mask in public. And if you have symptoms, talk to a healthcare provider about getting tested. To move forward, let's all do our part. So stay careful. Michigan.gov slash coronavirus. Michigan, we're calling on you to save lives. Don't ignore it. Don't let it go to voicemail. It's urgent. In fact, it's critical. Because if you've been in close contact with someone who tests positive for COVID-19, you may have been exposed to the virus. And you could get a call from My COVID Help or your local health department. So please answer the call to learn how to protect yourself, your family, and friends. We're calling on you to stop the spread of COVID-19, to make it safe to reopen businesses and help Michigan move forward. So if you get a call, from my COVID help or your local health department, you may have been exposed to someone with COVID-19. To protect us all, answer the call. Learn more at michigan.gov slash contain COVID. A message from the Michigan Department of Health and Human Services. It's been a great uh, edition of the Oakland County Megacast. A lot of entertainment news for us to get to, but we are going to wrap up the show today with a little bit of a different uh, subject for us. The owners of Chefs for Seniors, Leah Jackson and Michael Jackson, join us on the Oakland County Megacast. Thank you so much for being with us. Thanks for having us. We're excited. Yeah. For those not familiar with Chefs for Seniors, fill us in. What is the program and how did you uh, become a part of it? Well, the program is Chefs for Seniors. We prepare about a week's worth of meals in one visit inside the home of our clients. And how we came across it was through Mike. Go ahead. Like, um, we were looking for a business venture. Um, we've both been in food service for several years. Um, I've been a, a chef for over 20 years. Uh, Leah has been uh, food service management. And we came across this opportunity to work with senior citizens, getting helping them uh, get healthy, fresh meals, and at the same time, spend time with them. 
Um, and from my time working in nursing homes, I knew the, about the need for it. And Leia is really well, good, really good with people. And we just thought what a great idea and what a great opportunity. I would imagine that this is even more important during the pandemic when seniors are concerned about the people they are interacting with. So has it been a boost to your business or did it take a turn downward because they were afraid to have people come in? It initially with everything, there was an initial hit to our services, but really it wasn't long before we were seeing a spike because of the concern. We're going to the grocery stores and we are um, preventing the seniors and really the individual, because we also focus on veterans as well, um, preventing them from having to go to the grocery store, preventing them from having to figure out, hey, what am I gonna eat because I only have so much in my cabinet and bringing it into their homes and preparing it. And they don't even have to worry about cleaning things or even having to um, move around the kitchen that would otherwise injure them or harm them. And we do it all for them and we even bring our own equipment. So, yeah. Mm -hmm. So, and how do you ensure them that you are, are not, uh, you have not been exposed to the virus. Are you getting tested on a regular basis? What does that uh, look like? So for our chefs, we ensure that they, we are keeping our social distance from the clients altogether. We make sure we disinfect everything and that also helps by having our own equipment. But our uh, chefs are temperature, they will check their own temperature uh, before the day starts. Um, we ensure they have face coverings, even with our own logo. Uh, we also make sure that our chefs know that while we are being social distant and doing everything we, everything we can to keep that barrier between us and the clients, but we also make sure that, you know, we are, um, uh, well, use, of course, using our own equipment, but yeah, staying in the kitchen. Leah and Michael Jackson with us today. They are from the they from Chef for Seniors joining us today on the Oakland County Megacast. So for those that maybe are curious about your serv services for themselves or for a loved one, where can people get more information and, and how do people get uh, in contact with you for services? Um, and what, what, what would qualify them to be able to get your service? Well, what makes us unique is that you do not need to qualify for our services. Mm -hmm. It's if you're hungry or if you just don't feel like cooking anymore, that's what we're here for. Um, in order to reach us, you can do one of two things. You can go online to our website, www.chefsforseniors.com. You'll be able to look through our menus and also send an inquiry through there, or just give us a call at 248-464-6067. So Michael, you have on the chef's apron there or the chef's jacket so i'm guessing you're the one who comes up with the meals how do you decide what is going to be cooked or is it like so many choices kind of like you know some of the home delivery meals that are popular right now it is to an extent uh, what separates us or one of the things that separates us is that we can customize the menus so uh, we have a uh, library of uh, approximately 60 um, menu ideas that we work with our clients on and they'll choose four menus for each visit. Um, so they're actually making the choice. But at the same time, um, if there's something that's not on our menu that they have um, a, a taste for or hankering for, we'll gladly uh, substitute it. Um, and again, with us being in the home and working with the clients, we can adjust the menus directly to them. So if there are any dietary restrictions or intolerances, we can easily accommodate that, and we do. Well, we know the food catering business has definitely taken a hit during this pandemic. Do you think there is going to be a greater need for personal chef to you know, those services for pe for you to come into people's homes. We do, and I think we're we're seeing an uprise um, more and more as everyone is becoming a little more accustomed 
to our situation um, and to be able to have access to the fresh meals, the healthy meals, one point of contact, one chef that's going to do the grocery shopping and come into your home. Um, and it seems that people are wanting to, we're, one of our goals is to help people age at home. And so hopefully that we're, we're accomplishing that, helping people do that. I would one imagine of the a lot of dignity it brings for them to be able to stay in their homes, right? Yes. 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 Um, we've spoken to individuals, in fact, just this morning, speaking to individuals who have issues with, you know, shoulder pain or even with hips, things of that nature that makes it difficult. And of course, they don't want to go um, another route that may be um, quick, such as email delivery, uh, mainstream programs that would get them their meals, but not necessarily as healthy as they like. So that's where we fit. One of the things that we are seeing across the Oakland County area right now, a shortage of employees. Are you having a hard time getting employees to work with you or do they like what you are offering it because it is so different? So, <laughs> but I don't take it to, we just hired another chef. We're bringing her on board and um, it's to the point right now where our area is expanding in, uh, where are we in? White Lake, uh, Waterford, Water, uh, Waterford Township. So we're growing. We need that additional help. So we're excited about that. This position as a person, a chef in this platform allows the chef within themselves to have flexibility. Um, mm -hmm. They're not beholden to um, working six days a week and working evenings and having to sacrifice the quality of life that they have for their own family. So the, uh, that's it's an honor for us to be able to be a benefit not only for our clients, but for our staff. So, yeah. And then we're also seeing with our chefs, um, the it's really gratifying to be able to spend time with the people that you're preparing meals for and to get to know know them um, is just really a, a a great additive it's to the to the position so the people that we are coming across are excited and really enjoy that that aspect we are a relief for them so yeah mm -hmm. So much isolation uh, during this pandemic. So having someone come in will be it has to be a, a nice for some of your clients and the seniors as well. And is it the same chef that will go back to the same clients week after week? Yes, yes. Outside of there being a situation where the chef has a vacation or something coming up, but that's already pre-planned and we have contingency plans for that. So, but yeah, we're normally same chef and that way they get a chance to know them and uh, yeah. So are you still hiring chefs? And if so, what is the background that you're looking for in a chef? Well, we are, we're always looking for uh, new talent and, uh, and chefs. And one of the things, I mean, would be a very diverse, um, background in cooking and understanding of uh, different food cultures because we we service quite a, a, a diverse population um, so having that knowledge of the different cultures the different techniques to be able to cook their um, those type of foods is extremely important but just as important is the personality is someone that's interested that understands what we're doing and why we're doing it um, so they can bring something to our clients besides besides meals and patience patience and care and yeah just the care and the integrity of their work and what they do and what we're here for so share with us again the areas that you do cover Certainly. Uh, West Bloomfield, Pontiac, Waterford, Franklin, uh, Farmington Hills, Auburn Hills, Rochester, um, and of course, Detroit area in the city. Um, yeah, Livonia. So you're pretty much everywhere throughout Oakland County. How does the yes. service work? Are they paying per meal or do you have a plan where you get so many meals a week 
and then they pick from that menu plan? So the clients are picking four menu options. Of those four menu options, they will get a total of 10 to 12 servings. So whether they are opting, and we hear it a lot, hey, you're giving us too much food, which I never would have imagined that, but they get about a week's worth of meals. And in those meals, they can get, well, they're one individual serving, but in our um, experience, we're seeing a lot of our senior folks getting two meals out of them. But it's really based on how often would you like us there, whether it's once a week, twice a week, or once a month. Show the container. Well, yeah, yeah. Michael, oh, yeah. and the container, these are the containers that they're in. Sometimes there'll be two container, two compartments, or there'll be single compartment containers. And so we'll go ahead and we'll fill it with whatever meal, whether it's vegetables, your protein, and your starch. And these will be stored away. They're BPA free, microwave safe, dishwasher safe. Leah and Michael Jackson with us on the Oakland County Megacast. They are the owners of Chefs for Seniors joining us today on the program. Uh, Leah, Michael, just a few more minutes with you today before we have to let you go and end today's program. Anything else that you would like our audience to know about Chefs for Seniors that would be uh, important for them to know about your organization or anything else that we haven't touched on today in this interview? You know, one thing that, in addition to everything that we back with our passion and everything, we have the support as being a franchise. In fact, we were the first franchise of Chefs for Seniors in the state of Michigan. And so we are, we're here for a purpose. We see the need. Um, we're here. We're ready. Um, we are local owners. And so we understand the area. And we're here to help. We want to grow. We want everyone to grow with us. So, yeah. Michael? Just um, that if you if you know of someone that's having uh, difficulties um, obtaining consistently fresh meals, or if someone who wants a homemade meal, uh, we come across quite a few people who have downsized, their, their kids are gone, and they just no longer wish to cook every day. We are we are a healthy option for you, okay, and a, an affordable one. Mm -hmm. Even if you're just getting out of the hospital for something simple, knee right. surgery or whatever the case may be, you, we will never be holding you to a long-term contract. If it's something where you just need help in between for a month or so, we're okay with that too. We actually do not have contracts. We are confident in our service and, our, and what we do. So we are um, service to service. So if at any point you need to pause the service or you decide to go another direction, we understand. It is a great service. I know sometimes people that have surgery, sometimes you can't raise your arms or you can't lift something over so many pounds. So they're unable to cook for themselves. So it is good to know that something like this is available. As new or as business owners, we want to support local people what has this experience been like for you as business owners and do you suggest us other people try to venture out and own their own business yes without a doubt <laughs> <laughs> yes still do it um stealing it from the high schoolers yolo you only live once so it's like especially with this pandemic this has definitely taught us that um one thing for sure um that this has taught us is technology and doing everything we've gotten away from paper and have had to do our business almost 100 percent online which is okay it's uh something that we needed to really push for to do anyway so it's been unique and yet a very needed experience We've all had to learn and grow throughout this pandemic. Leah Jackson, Michael Jackson, owners of Chefs for Seniors, thanks so much for being with us today and sharing with us uh, your services, but as well your experience as business owners here in the Oakland County area. Awesome. Thank you for Thank having you. us.
So a uh, great service um, when they, they were originally going to be on with us uh, last week, I think, but had to cancel. And so I was checking out their services, Tyler, and yep. this really is something that is needed within the community. Imagine if your parents are still living alone, they don't yep. want to go into an assisted living facility. They want to stay in their homes. This is something that is great. Uh, for them to be able to have access to. So we invite people, if you do have seniors in your life, that you check out their services, Chefs for Seniors. Uh, so, But to them, to the Jacksons, and to all of our guests today, we appreciate them taking the time with us to be on the Oakland County Megacast. Uh, so that will pretty much wrap it up for us here on this Wednesday. Thank you for tuning in. Tyler, thank you for all of your hard work, as well as Larry, our Zoom producer, Jake, our producer who helps book all of the guests. And we want to remind people, if you want to be on the Oakland County Megacast, just reach out to us. Uh, we are always looking for new guests and new people to bring to the light and the community. Thank you for tuning in to the Oakland County Megacast.